The election of 1946 would be the first election of the modern era. With the war over, Labour would attempt to win, for their first time, a second full term in office. In this election, the Labour Party would be running under new leadership, while a brand new opposition force would challenge them under the leadership of a familiar figure. In most cases, a mid-election leader change, combined with a brand new party forming, would qualify for quite the eventful election. So the fact that the election of 1946 is considered the most uneventful election of the 1940s shows you just how chaotic of a time period this was. After the election of 1943, Prime Minister John Curtin and Labour as a whole were riding an all-time high. They had just won a huge majority in the election and fought back the Japanese Empire with the help from their new allies, the United States. As Allied forces continued to push the military forces of Japan back towards their home islands, Curtin was able to focus more on social policies at home. Since taking office, Curtin had been implementing large social reforms. Big winners of these reforms were women and Indigenous Australians who gained more eligibility in receiving welfare benefits. Other winners included students who would be exempt from military service while they finished their studies, widows with children who would receive pensions to help with their, support their families, and Commonwealth workers who would all become eligible for long service leave. One of Curtin's biggest legalisation achievements would be the signing of the Statute of Westminster Adoption Act, in which Australia would finally ratify and accept its new Dominion status laid out by the 1931 Statute of Westminster. This act would see the British Parliament relinquish almost all of its legislative power over Australia, and to this day it is often viewed as the moment Australia became a fully independent nation. Despite most of his political decisions being extremely popular, Curtin did however make several controversial decisions which would end up plaguing the Labour Party for a long time to come. The first was a change to the Conscription Act to allow Australian conscripts to be deployable outside of Australian territory. A move that you might remember led to the expulsion of former Labour leader Billy Hughes. Curtin would face a much more sympathetic party due to the current proximity of the conflict, but he would still face opposition from the devout Catholic wing of the party. Eventually an agreement was reached to allow conscripts to be deployable outside of Australia, but only if they were situated in areas associated with the defence of Australia. The second and far more controversial move was the 1944 referendum in which the government would request the ability to take almost total control of the economy for a five year period after the war to rebuild the country. This move would fail with 54% of Australians voting against the move, only gaining the majority of support in South and Western Australia. This move would be seen by many as a massive power grab by the Labour Party and would raise concerns about their ability to govern democratically. As the war drew to a close, Curtin would find himself frequently travelling to Britain and the United States for war talks with his peers Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt. These regular trips would end up taking a large toll on Curtin's health and he would suffer a heart attack in November 1944 and would be absent from the Parliament until January the next year. Upon returning to Parliament, Curtin's health would continue to decline at a rapid pace. Curtin would finally succumb to his health issues and pass away on the 5th of July 1945, just shy of two months after fellow US President Roosevelt also passed away. Thus Curtin would become the second Australian Prime Minister to die by an office, only a mere six years after Joseph Lyons became the first. At nine years and 277 days, Curtin had become the longest serving Labour leader in the party's history, only to be surpassed by Gough Whitlam in 1976. Under his leadership, Curtin had rebuilt the Labour Party from its huge loss in 1931 to now govern with its largest majority ever. Suffice to say, the new leader was going to have very large shoes to fill. The man to take the role as Prime Minister would be the very same man Curtin had defeated in 1935 to take the leadership position in the first place, Deputy Labour leader Frank Ford. Ford was a veteran politician, having served in Parliament since being elected back in 1922 to the Queensland seat of Capricornia. He had served in the ill-fated school and government as Minister for Trade and Customs, after its previous minister, James Fenton, left to join the United Australia Party. After surviving the disastrous election of 1931, Ford would move up the ranks to serve as Deputy Labour Leader, where he would serve under both Schoolin until his resignation and Curtin until his death, upon which Ford would become the 16th Prime Minister on the 6th of July 1945. Ford's time as Prime Minister, however, would be short-lived. Four days after travelling to Perth for Curtin's funeral, Ford would host a caucus meeting to determine the next leader of the Labour Party. In the meeting, several names would be put forward, including Ford's. However, he would decisively lose to Treasurer and longtime colleague of Curtin, Joseph Benedict Chiefly, or Ben Chiefly. Thus, after seven days, Ford would pass on the role as Prime Minister, on to Chiefly becoming the shortest serving Prime Minister in Australian history, and the only Prime Minister to have never led a party. He, however, would keep his job as Deputy Leader, under Chiefly, where he would remain until 1946, 
becoming, ironically, the longest serving deputy leader of the Labour Party in Australian history at 14 years and 224 days. Now elected as Prime Minister, Chiefly would oversee the end of Australia's involvement in World War II. Chiefly originally was a train driver from New South Wales. He had previously made a name for himself in Parliament as the man behind Australia's domestic policies, while Curtin worked on the war. Thus a lot of people saw Chiefly as a good replacement for Curtin as the war ended, and Australia looked away from the Pacific and towards its own reconstruction. On the 15th of August, just over a month since Curtin had passed away, the Japanese Empire surrendered to the Allied forces after two atomic bombs were dropped on major cities in their home islands, and a new Soviet defensive wiped out their holdings in the Asian mainland. Thus World War II would come to an end. With the war finally over, Chiefly would face two tasks. One was reconstructing a nation depleted by war, and the second was attempting to win a historic second full term in office, something no Labour government had ever achieved before in history. However, his road to victory would not be as easy as it was back in 1943. For one, Chiefly was not as popular as Curtin. Chiefly had only led Australia through the last months of the war, and lacked a lot of the charm his predecessor had. He was also facing a new threat on the other side of Parliament, led by a familiar figure. After being ousted as leader of the coalition, Robert Menzies had almost left politics for good. He was encouraged to stay on by several of his supporters in Canberra. While on the backbench of Parliament, Menzies began a series of weekly radio broadcasts to whom he called the Forgotten People. Hmm, wonder if we've heard that before. These were people who were not part of the rich elites or members of organised labour. Menzies appealed to the ideas of independent freedom, democracy and progress based on private enterprise. Through these broadcasts, Menzies became very popular as a figure for classical liberalism, and with his newfound identity, he would turn his attention back to the front bench of Parliament. Menzies would regain the leadership of the United Australia Party of the now 81-year-old Billy Hughes, who took over leading the party in the absence of a proper leader. I still have trouble remembering this guy was elected back in 1901. Now with control of the party, Menzies declared the UAP as dead, as it no longer served its original purpose, and at this point most of its members had left to join other parties. In 1944, Menzies would host a meeting in Albury, New South Wales, with members of multiple non-Labour parties, and propose that they unify together to form a party based on the ideology of liberalism and free market enterprise. Thus, this was to be called the Liberal Party of Australia, and yes, this is the Liberal Party of today. And thus, the election was set for the 28th of September 1946, and it would be the first election with the familiar party layout we all know to this day with Labour representing the left side of politics and the Liberal Party and the Country Party, who they had recently reformed the coalition with, representing the right side of the party. And the winner was... Ben Chiefly and Labour with a comfortable 43 seats, a loss of 6, and 54.1% of the two party preferred. Thus, for the first time in Australian history, Labour had won two elections in a row. Menzies and his newly found party were successful in picking up six seats, including a surprise win in fourth seat of Capricornia, giving the coalition 29 seats. Despite the gains, Labour's popularity was still at an all-time high after World War II, thus the coalition would remain in opposition for another three years. This election also saw two independents get elected in the form of Doris Blackburn and our old friend Jack Lang, who made his first foray into federal politics, still under the Lang Labour brand. After this election, questions began to be raised if Menzies' Liberal Party would work as an effective opposition force to Labour, and rumours began to spread that Menzies would soon be replaced as its leader for a more popular figure. Meanwhile, Labour, still with their majority in both houses, would soon find their reconstruction efforts in a lot of trouble. Come back next time for the election of 1949.